All right, hey there, space cowboys, cowgirls, whatever you identify as. <laughs> uh, welcome back to the channel. This is Rob here, and we are back talking more Cowboy Bebop season one on Netflix, the new live action version of the original anime starring John Cho as Spike Spiegel. And uh, uh, yeah, we took a bit of a break here. Work, I work in customer service, and it's the holidays. And every day I've been more wiped out and more wiped out, plus donating plasma. You know, a couple of times a week really takes it out of you. So it took me all the way till today to finally get to talking about episode 7 called Galileo Hustle. So before we get started, if you're not already a subscriber, make sure you're hitting that subscribe button if you could. Helps with my motivation. Like, you know, share, hit the bell for all notifications, all that jazz. Um, so anyway, it is Thanksgiving. And, uh... Yeah, I, it, it this is probably going to be the only video I upload other than uh, Wheel of Time Episode 4 should be coming out for the first season of that. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to be taking it easy today and a bit of tomorrow. Also, you can check me out tonight if you want to know what I think of the new Hawkeye series over on D's Reviews at 8 o'clock Central Standard Time, 6 o'clock Pacific. I'll be over there. Talking the first two episodes of Hawkeye. Uh, now that all the Marvel shills have kissed the ring, uh, now hear what uh, people who aren't getting paid, <laughs> and by that I mean uh, don't have their monetization all, uh, you know, their channels all wrapped up in kissing Disney's ass. So, anyway, on with the review for Galileo Hustle. Now, this one. The last episode I said was my least favorite. This one, uh, and I liked it still, but it was my least favorite of the six. Now we got episode seven. There's only three episodes left after this. And I thought that this one was just a nice, interesting story that had a really kind of cool twist at the end. As we still keep exploring Faye Valentine's backstory and her past and her desire to learn who she really was. And by... Do it to in order to do that though she has to confront her recent past with her fake mother Whitney who's a con woman and it holds the key to her past or she thinks she does and I really liked uh, the simplicity of this even in you know because a lot of con job uh, stuff usually has a lot of like complicated twists and turns and you got to be paying attention. But it also deals with, you know, Jet trying to get to his daughter's recital. We get a bit of that. And we also have a bit of Julia and Vicious uh, is their plan to take over the uh, the syndicate, uh, getting rid of the elders, and who's playing who in that as well. So there's a lot of double crosses possible in this episode, triple crosses, what have you. Um, so to just cover the, the B story in this, that's Julia and Vicious' side of things. Again, it all hinges on whether or not you believe uh, Julia's intentions. Um, because there's like complications between the love triangle with her vicious and fearless. Um, because as scared as she is, she also seems to kind of love vicious. And she, you know, has this love for fearless. When she confronts Anna about him being alive, she's like, I could have gone to him. You know, but, you know, Anna's telling her, you guys would be on the run forever. But Julia feels to me like way more savvy than she's letting on. And I, if you know the anime at all, you know that there's like more to this than just simple. I love this guy. Why am I, you know, like I'm afraid of this guy because she is afraid of Vicious. But if you also know Fearless it was pretty vicious himself, you know, in another life. So you've got this kind of woman in the middle that's like the... They always kind of portray the characters as the damsel in distress. But I don't see Julia as a damsel in distress at all. I feel like she is in a situation that she doesn't like. Vicious could kill her, right? She was... He did put the gun to her head. He did pull the trigger. Now, up until that point, though, that he pulled the trigger, was she fine with her Latin life? Was she happy? 
Uh, you know, it's kind of hard to say because, like I said, the punishment that the elders gave Vicious by having him put the gun on her and having him pull the trigger didn't just uh, mess with him. It showed her what he's willing to do, and now she's got to protect herself. Was she before that, though, kind of, you know, like I said, happy with her lot? And now that Vicious is planning on taking out the elders... And she knows that Fearless is back. Is she manipulating things for her own ends? And it's, you know, this is where the very, the film noir kind of stuff comes in. Where everybody's always, you know, intentions and, and aren't always fully there. Things are kind of in gray areas. So I keep thinking more along the lines that Julia is using all the information she's gathering to end up on top herself. Um, now it could be more simple than that. It could be that she just wants out, out from under from Vicious. Because he is crazy. Everybody knows it. Mao knows it. They all know that he's a mad dog. And he, you know, probably has abused her, you know, the way that he is, right? Uh, he's, he seems like a very small man in the end. A very petty man, a very jealous man. And he does need to go. So I, I'm really curious at how this is going to play out because, you know, we have Vicious setting up the coup, but then you have Julia showing up at Mao saying, hey, you can have the whole thing. I just want out from under this. And that means killing Vicious. But in the end, I still kind of see Julia as I'm going to give everybody what they think they want. I'm going to get rid of the guy that's in the way of this and maybe I can take the whole thing over. I still think that she wants everybody to believe that she's just, oh, I'm just the girl in the middle. I mean, she said she's the one, you know, that came up with this plan. So this plan she's come up with, she's kind of telegraphing a little bit, that, to me at least, that she wants it all. But maybe not. Maybe not. I could be completely wrong about this. And maybe it's just I've seen way too many heist movies and con movies and noir movies uh, that I just don't trust Julia's tensions. But I don't really, you know, I don't really care <laughs> if Julia ends up on top or if she really loves Fearless or not. I like I like these kind of stories that where in the end, you know, uh, you find out what. We're just, we just got to get there. So now we're to the A story, right? So Whitney, this woman who unfroze Faye and pretended to be her mother to steal her benefits, is back. And she wants a ride off of the planet to get away from her current husband who is a notorious arms dealer, which you know, everybody's freaking out about. This guy shows up. He even scares Spike, who is pretty unflappable about most things and in fact he's very sarcastic and and feels very you know he's a very confident character so this guy's showing up and, and ruffling their feathers including jets uh means something but what i really like is how it all plays out there's a really great scene where they're trying to do the right thing for Faye, you know uh to get her her identikit. Another cool thing is while Whitney comes in and and woos them, she woos them completely. You know, giving them the recipe for the dumplings, like winning Spike over simply by taking care of his migraines, giving them a new recipe for dumplings, like the key to Spike's heart is his stomach in a lot of ways. You know, he's invested. He's like, oh, he just totally buys into the mother thing, which gets a little creepy for a second when they're like, hey, man, I'm talking about moms. <laughs> and Jet's kind of reading it a little dirty. And Spike's way he's talking about it feels dirty, but I don't think it is. Um, but I was worried that these guys wouldn't see through Whitney. Because to the audience, and we, I mean, we're watching it, we know she's up to no good. We know she can't be trusted. So do these guys who, one's an ex-cop, one's an ex, you know, killer, 
like for uh, a, a crime syndicate, wouldn't these guys be able to see through this obvious ploy? And while Spike's maybe enamored with her, Jet is um, like reads the situation and gets to the bottom of it. I like that they're not idiots. Spike quickly comes right on board once he's given the information he's not one of those people who's like well maybe there's another side to things no jet sees the body language jet notices they don't look alike you know they don't look like mother and daughter and he quietly not obviously he quietly investigates and then finds out that there's a huge bounty on her and she's not who she says she is and the biggest harm that they've had is that they feel like, you know, Faye could have talked to them. Faye could have, you know, said something. But in Faye's defense, right, she's an amnesiac who's been on her own, tricked by people, you know, doesn't know who to trust because of it. Somebody wakes you up, takes everything, and you have no identity. You're going to have your guard up and not necessarily trust people i absolutely no understand where Faye is coming from I, I have like lots of trust issues i always feel like people are getting ready to stab me in the back because of bad things that have happened when you have that kind of uh when you're most of the things that you have most of your memories are of people who take advantage of you you are going to have a hard time just trusting even the simple things with people like i do this all the time where i should just say something and I don't because I'm worried of how the reaction will be or whether or not somebody can handle something or whether, whether they'll just go, oh, well, you know, like, like turn their back on me or, or screw me over. So I absolutely get this, you know. But I also understand it from their side of things is that, hey, we've been nothing but good to you, you know. Like we let you be here. Like we brought you on. You, we, If we didn't want you here, you wouldn't be here. And as much as Spike... You know, early on has got the gun on her and wanting to kill her. They've bonded. They all like each other now. And maybe it's happening a little faster than it did in the in the anime, and that there was a lot more <laughs> distrust um, going on in the anime. But I still like both uh, ways to tell the story. I I still say I, I think I like this version of Faye a little bit better, uh, just because she's more fleshed out to me. But. Once they're on their own, right? So Jet and Spike have to go lead the Iron Mink away while Faye and Whitney go to get the Identikit. The funny, the fun part of this is Jet going to his daughter's recital. I still love this that they can like just be somewhere else as a hologram and be, you know, be in another room and enjoying something else. Meanwhile, they're just in a room. Uh, and so while he's at the recital and also on at Santo City, you know, Spike's in the background fighting the arms dealers. It's a really well-crafted uh, scene to me. Like, it's really entertaining that he's dancing for his daughter and Spike's kicking the butts of the arms dealers behind him. But we also get more sweet, a sweet moment here for Jet, who is trying. And, and finally, his ex-wife sees that he's trying and and gets a little bit more open to jet seeing his daughter even the guy his you know old cop ex ex friend uh who took you know who who swooped in on his on his wife when things weren't going great between them even he is saying hey look jet's trying and jet's allowing that to happen and taking that compliment and and, and allowing you know like it, it's starting to feel like a more healthy uh, situation for everyone involved and that's nice to see because a lot of times it's just that the running thing is always everybody hates each other and people don't get along and in reality a lot of people have to deal with people that they wouldn't normally have to deal with and you have to figure out how to navigate those relationships without when it comes to a kid and what's best for the kid and sometimes you have to suck it up and be nice to the people you wouldn't normally want to be nice to for the sake of relationships. Another thing that I've got to get better at. <laughs> um, so in the end, though, Whitney uh, and Faye go to her warehouse where she's got all this stuff that she's been stealing. And when 
she pours it on thick. And this is where I thought the episode had a chance to fail for me, which was Whitney trying to say, why don't you come with me? You know, you don't really need to know who you are. And I, I it was this really obvious stuff happening where I was like, oh, she could clearly just go, yo, were you right? And, and then get screwed over by Whitney. Because that's where I thought it was going. Because the scene before that, when they're with the, the, the valet, it was, it's a horrible, obvious con. You know, the, the way that they torture this guy. Oh, oh pretend offense and stuff. It's, it's everywhere in bad, in bad con scenes. But it's fine. It's just silly. But here, I was glad to see that Faye sticks to her guns and finds the box, and inside is just a VCR tape, which I love, because she doesn't know what it is. She's like, what the fuck are you? <laughs> There's a few good, really good lines in here. I love when Spike says, why is everybody's family problems my problems? I'm the one that's the orphan. I love that. Um, everybody loves a nice story, what Whitney says. It's not lying, it's just a story. Um... But in the end, the funniest thing is that none of this was actually real. <laughs> and by that I mean the con. Uh, Whitney was never being chased by the Iron Mink. In, she was never in uh, danger. This was all part of a long, kinky sex game. And that this is what they do. They role play, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> Let's and, like Think about it, because the Iron... Mink allowed his men to be killed by Spike in order for them, those two, to come to a, to make sexy time more sexy. <laughs> so this was all just a ruse to like getting everybody involved. Uh, <sighs> but Faye, do Faye does get a new ship out of it and sorry for the banging in the background. I'm not the only one here on this Thanksgiving day. Um, so Faye gets a new ship out of it. Whitney gets to have kinky sex with her arms dealer boyfriend. And I think they have a new recipe for dumplings. And Faye, though, here at the end, gets to see a videotape of what she was like 15 years ago. And it was really sweet. She apparently knows how to play the piano. And she doesn't seem that far off from who she is now. She's just a bit more innocent. And seeing that innocence in her own face, knowing that she has a mom, knowing that she was clearly loved and in a happy place and a cheerleader, apparently, is a really nice ending to this. So I'm really happy that I, I was worried that uh, after last episode it was going to be more of a downward trend, but this was a really good episode. So anyway... If you like this little look at episode 7, please hit the like button. Don't forget to comment in the comments below what you think of these episodes that are happening. Uh, share, subscribe, all that stuff. I gotta get out of here before the pounding gets worse. So, this is Rob saying see you later, cowboys, cowgirls, as we will see you on episode 8.